Guys, what's going on? Welcome to Serial at Midnight. My name is Heath, and I am joined for a very special conversation about canon films by the man who wrote the book about canon films. Actually, three of them. Austin Trunick, welcome to Serial at Midnight. Hello, thank you for having me. As I just smacked my microphone, this is the book that we are talking about. This is volume one of three. This is The Canon Film Guide, volume one, 1980 to 1984. And I think for the next 17 hours, we are going to geek out about <laughs> canon films. I see the Chuck Norris Delta, is it Delta Force, right? You, Delta Garb, Force 2, yes. Garbage. Yeah, media home video. Uh, they sent these out to store clerks back in 1990 when the movie was coming out on video and yeah I was lucky enough to find a find a set so so you weren't a store clerk you just picked this up later is that yes as a, as a collector yes, that's correct nice I almost didn't see you because you're camouflaged and you've got those lunch boxes the lunchbox collection behind you it's like that scene in uh, well there's a scene in predator there's the scene in first blood part two you, it, you're just like just blending in. Yeah, if I get too nervous, I'm just going to take a few steps backwards and just slowly disappear. Oh, where did he go? What, what happened? <laughs> I was in the middle of an interview and the dude just walked out. He just disappeared. Um, I'm just going to make a rapture joke. It's like the rapture happened and I did <laughs> Okay, so canon films. Like, I, I got to tell you, I, I've been – this is – I was going to just, like – skim through it you know i was like oh well because this is the first four years that you've covered in this book listen we're going to go back to the beginning we're going to talk about how this came to be we're going to talk about when your mother and your father first laid eyes on no but we're going to talk about i want to talk about the genesis of this book but first of all i just want to talk about the book like it's over 500 pages this is the canon films bible and I don't think anything like this has ever been done before. I mean, you would know more than I would, but this feels pretty cutting edge, right? It's the first time anybody has looked at the entire output of canon, the under Golden Globus, in, in, a, in especially in a book form. And yeah, I, I, I aimed for being comprehensive and covering everything and anything yeah. I could get my hands on. And hence why it's going to be broken up into three volumes. Uh, there's just there's way too much for a single book. It's First, incredible. I, I was going to, so I was just going to like, oh, I want to read about, you know, like missing in action. And I want to read about like the, the high notes. I was just going to flip through here, but I'm doing cover to cover. That's what I'm doing. I, I just like, well, I can't help it. Started on the introduction. By the way, I say it's over 500 pages. The introductions itself, you got a, you got a forward by Sam Furstenberg. Okay. The director of, yeah. American, how many movies? Let's see. The, the it's American yeah, he's, Ninja. He's a re hero. Revenge of the Ninja, Ninja Three, Breaking Two, Electric Boogaloo, Avenging Force, the ever underrated Avenging Force. Yes. Yeah. He's, and, and you're like, we have to talk a little bit about the context of where these movies came from before we could talk about these movies. This is all the introduction, and then it's just like, boom! You present, you you set the stage for this meal, and before I even know it, I'm just like digging into all this stuff. This is an incredible book, and um, the thing that impresses me most about it, it, like I'm just holding it off camera, people can't even see it, scholarship, and it's like no stone is unturned. I've never even heard of this movie before. I don't think I have. Maybe I have and just forgot it, but Teen Mothers, a.k.a. Seed of Innocence. Guess what? I read about it, and now I have to see this movie. This is the, this is the part of, like, you read the book, and then you're like, I got to track this down. Did you, did you track all these movies that like how that's a good place to start? How yeah. Did you see, yeah. How did you find I, had, I had to track everything down. And fortunately some of these things by 2015, which is when this project began, yeah. were on Blu-ray. Some of them were on DVD. Many of them were still just video. And that was, that was a challenge. There's luckily a lot of great VHS collecting groups on Facebook that who were a huge help to even find mm -hmm. things like, Teen Mothers, which was near impossible to find because it's a pretty obscure one. Or yeah. Secret of Yolanda is another one that's covered in there. And it took me forever to find a tape. And yeah, once I could hunt those down, popping them in the old VCR, and usually at the same time, I'd record them to, to the computer so then I could rewatch and rewatch right. and rewind scenes much easier. Yeah. But yeah, a lot of it was a hunt. There were movies that are in this book that 
I couldn't find copies of until, yeah, just before I sent it off to the publisher. But that's part of the fun. I mean, I always had a little bit, I always had that collector mentality and the hunting for the stuff was, was a very enjoyable time. Over the Brooklyn Bridge, that's another one. I'm like, what is over the Brooklyn Bridge? But it's in here and I'll learn all about it. So where did this, are you a child of the 80s? Did you grow up in the VHS era, the rental era? Yeah, yeah. I think a lot of hardcore movie fans, especially of a certain generation, it, it all started there in the rental shop. I grew up kind of in the middle of nowhere. Yeah, our closest movie theater was about 30 minutes away. And, but we had video stores. And every Friday night, we'd go and you'd rent a stack of movies. And that would be your entertainment for the entire weekend. Mm -hmm. And that was my mom and dad. And where I first saw a lot of the Canon covers, Canon movies came in these big, amazing boxes. Mm -hmm. And they were awesome artwork. And I remember later on seeing things like the Masters of the Universe cover and being fascinated with the Drew Struzan art. And yeah, and that's really where my canon love began. Then when I got older, I could rent them myself, which was nice. Yeah. I don't even know if they're showing up, but I'll put these right here. Yeah. Yeah, two beauties. And when yeah, canon was everywhere. Every shelf in the, in the movie store. You can find them in musicals, action, science fiction, horror, everywhere. Those were magical days too, because I don't know. I don't want to be the old guy who's like, Oh, we've lost so much, but I do feel like with everything going digital, the way it has the experience that we would have of walking into the video store and just browsing this browsing the box art for things. Mm -hmm. um, how do you look at this box art? You know, I mean, even oldie, but a goodie, like everybody knows this one. Everybody <laughs> loves blood sport, but like, how do you see this? And here's my the rental copy of uh, Street Smart wow. with all the stickers on it. Beautiful and the cut in the box. So nine ninety five previewed for nine ninety five. Um, but how do you you know you'd walk through the store and it would just be like these worlds coming out at you and that was a big part of the marketing of Canon in the first place, which I think they learned from Corman. And one right. of the things that I love about this book is you, Corman comes up a lot. I feel like. Yeah, uh, the guy who. The two guys that ran Canon, Menachem Golan and Norm Globus, in the era that we think of Canon, 1980 onward, till they, mm -hmm. their demise in the 90s, they, Golan and spe specifically, started as part of the Corman family tree. He worked on the Young Racers, which is the same set that included um, Francis Ford Coppola, Robert Town, and Menachem yeah. Golan. That's a whole huge cinematic pedigree in just one B movie set. And yeah, and he definitely had a very, you could tell he had a high respect for Corman and what he did and how he did it and yeah. learned a lot from just that brief amount of time because immediately after he worked on that movie, he went back to Israel and made his first, his first features. He went right into the business of making movies. Mm -hmm. And they would present these, you know, you talk in the book about how you'd start with a poster or a pitch and then they build movies around this. And I don't know, there was just something magical about <laughs> it's, it's easy to look at this stuff ironically, right? But you don't. And that's one of the things that I appreciate th about the book is that it is, it's all things. It's scholarship, it's interviews. It's full of so much information. You've, you've done so much research. You've watched all these movies, but there's no tone of, superiority you're not better than these movies you're not looking down on these movies you love these movies and we love these movies and so i feel like there's this connection between the reader and the author you who've written this book can you tell me just a little bit about your love for these i'm not imagining that right like you love this stuff no, i do i really do i i say in the book that even though a lot of canon's movies aren't traditionally good or critically acclaimed they're most almost every one of them is entertaining is from the moment you start watching it till the end yeah. save for a select few but yeah that's something that i wanted to do in the book i didn't want to be cynical at all and i know a lot of b-movie criticism can lean towards being cynical mm -hmm. and that's a little frustrating because these are movies that people wanted to make and most of the people who made them talking to them you know that they were aware that these weren't going to be oscar winners when they were working on them they wanted to make a movie that would entertain people and yeah. on that front they they succeeded i i really think with a lot of these films 
despite and especially at canon fans any canon fan will yeah look at that and say like this this b action movie is the most possible fun i could be having right now watching this and yeah that's that's where i came from it i wanted to look at these in a respectful way and yeah that's that's that was my goal setting out yeah it's a, it's a modern trend now i do notice in the film <laughs> the online community about movies mm-hmm. it's very easy to become uh jaded about some of this stuff but we love these movies and the people that, as you point out the people that made them wanted to make them and they weren't making them they wanted us to have fun with them they're for mm-hmm. us to enjoy they're not <laughs> you know what i mean like they're inviting us in right. and i think it's a mistake to judge to, to, to judge from the outside they're come in and have fun mm-hmm. and so many times in the book I, i've certainly not finished it uh, cause it's, it's huge and it's amazing. <laughs> but, uh, so many times in the book, you'll say it's silly or it, you'll, you, you know, it's this, mm-hmm. but that's what it was supposed to be. Right. And I think that's important. So I just wanted to say that, that this is not a work of irony. This is not a work of parody. This is a work of love. And that's why I love it. The so. Deepest part of my heart. Absolutely. Yeah. So, okay. So video store days, you're walking around, you see all this wonderful Canon box art. Do you remember some of your earlier Canon, like childhood canon favorites or experiences? Yeah, well, some probably my earliest experience is seeing some of these covers. The, the Revenge of the Ninja cover. Um, got it right here, this, nice. this one. And things like New Year's Evil and I mentioned the Master Universe. Those were all covers that I remember vividly walking past them every time at the store. Then when I got older, about early, early teen years, 12, 13 years old, we had a video store that was near our school and they really didn't really weren't very hard about their rating system and who they'd rent things to. So I got very fortunate at 12 years old. I could rent things like New Year's Evil, Enter the Ninja, Exterminator 2 and after school. And I'd taken them, we'd watch them in my buddy's basement. And we'd... Were they like, there's a room in the back of the store with a curtain. You just go <laughs> on in there. That's fine. Just yeah. Well, they they had role. They had they had one role, I guess, oh, an unspoken role, and that was that if there was obvious sexual content in it, they wouldn't rent it to a twelve-year-old. So okay, that's, that's something that's like, good. yeah, something like Last American Virgin. I didn't see until I was an adult because the title is Last American Virgin. Yeah, but Invasion USA, no problem, no problem. You just take it home, kid. Well, that's the thing, right? It's like violence, especially in the 80s, violence. It was just like, bring it on. But then the yeah. sexual stuff was like, no, 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 no. Mm-hmm. It's very, very pick and choose about what was acceptable. But we loved, man, we grew up, I, I, I think we're the same age or close to it. We grew up on Rambo yeah. and we grew like, we love this stuff. Talking yeah. about Cobra, you know, like, oh <laughs> man, OG yeah. action I mean, hero right there. Robocop and Rambo had toys <laughs> marketed to children yeah. younger than us. Cartoon because, series too. Yeah. Okay, so uh, you're you're walking the aisles. You see Masters of the Universe. Did you see Masters of the Universe, the movie, w- at, like around that time? When I was young, yeah, that was one that my parents would have rented for me because they knew the cartoon. And so I, how did you how did you reconcile this is not the cartoon? How, what was your experience with that? Well, at that point. I think I was just so amazed by everything that was happening in it because I, it was before I would have seen Star Wars or any of the really great movies that it was yeah. obviously trying to do things similar to. And so I think I was just had my jaw dropped, even though it looked like nothing like the cartoon and had very few of the same characters. I didn't think I cared. I don't think I cared at that age. I, yeah. I just loved the spectacle. And you seeing. know what it did have was Dolph Lundgren. It was amazing. <laughs> and I will say it definitely had the best He-Man hair. I mean, the, Dolph Lundgren's yeah. haircut looked so much better than the cartoons. I will admit that even as a fan, somebody who enjoyed the cartoon. Yeah, absolutely. And then, like we all talk about Frank Langella's performance now too, because it was like, mm-hmm. It's a pretty legit performance for the movie he was in. Yeah, he acts the hell out of Skeletor. It's incredible. He does Skeletor like he's doing Henry Henry the Third on yeah. or Richard the Third and on on Broadway or Stratford. It's incredible. Just his movement is so elegant and his capes, turns, and flows. And you can tell he thought 
about every element of that as as if it were any performance he'd ever done in his life and wanted to do the best he could. It's just yeah. incredible. He's a great Skeletor. Absolutely. It's a shame there wasn't more of that because wasn't there going to be a sequel? Isn't that... Um... Talk yeah, they they were working on a sequel, and but it wouldn't have Dolph Lundgren. They had a professional surfer in the lead, and that fell through. It ended up becoming Cyborg in a very uh, sideways way. Part of that, they also been working on a Spider-Man movie, which started and stopped many times, and ultimately got scrapped and turned into Cyborg, <laughs> the Van Damme movie. I got something cool I can show you though on okay. the subject of Spider-Man. This is something I found back when this began, but it's a, Ooh. Oh, it's a crew jacket <laughs> for a movie that was never made. That's amazing. So they, not just posters before the movies were made crew jackets before yeah. the movies were made. Yeah. They made them and shipped them off to some of the people at Marvel who they were excited about the deal. The guys who, some of the guys who were supposed to be working at the time, but yeah, it's <laughs> You're like the ultimate collector, the ultimate canon collector. Look at you with a jacket. Oh, that's that, that's that's the prize of my collection. That's something that well, something I would love to do in volume three and what I'm aiming towards. Um, just because the canon books, this book is really the first volume follows their beginning and really to where they became very successful. They wanted to challenge the major studios, and they almost did. The second volume we'll cover 85 to 87, which is a lot of their big stuff, like Superman 4, Masters Universe, Over the Top, Life Force, Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2. They're big, expensive movies, the Delta Force, and where they kind of started to stumble because they were spending more than their movies were making, really, more than they could justify. Third one is kind of the straight-to-video era, and besides Bloodsport and Cyborg, there aren't the films that as many films that people love. And just to make the third volume more exciting, I want to put in a section called Cancelled Canon and just go into the dozens and dozens, if not a hundred projects that they had announced and just never came to be because I've got artwork, I've got some mock-up poster drawings and proposals and pitches and just stuff that's like, oh my goodness. I wish this had come out, some of it, and, or I wish I just knew what this would look like. Some of those projects ended up becoming other things for other studios, but not all of them. Not all of them. A lot of them just disappeared to time. That is exciting, just the idea of that, because this is breaking news that there's going to be <laughs> canceled canon. That's amazing. Wow. So, okay. So you're a kid. You like canon movies. You, you, I'm assuming it follows you through your teenage years, you know. Mm-hmm. When do you say, someone should write a book about this? But not just any book. Someone should write, like, the authoritative guide. The, <laughs> the canon film guide. Where does this come from? That's Because it's a very ambitious thing to do, you know. Like, I, I just have to know where the genesis of this came from. Yeah, well, I've been writing about movies... Um, for various outlets, mainly for a, a magazine, Under the Radar magazine, for over a decade now. And right about to early 2013, 14, 15, they started putting some of these movies out on Blu-ray, uh, Kino Lorber and Shout Factory. Mm-hmm. And some of them had commentaries by Sam Furstenberg and James Bruner and guys who were coming out and they were telling their canon stories. And and hearing these, it's like, oh my Goodness, I love canon. Good old Steve Carver classic there. I love, I love canon, but the stories behind the movies are usually as entertaining, if not sometimes more entertaining than the movies themselves. And so I started researching and I started putting together, writing these essays, and I didn't know what they were going to be. Originally, I thought maybe one book where I'd write about my 30 favorite canon movies and the stories yeah. behind them. And then as I got deeper, it's just turned into something bigger and bigger and bigger and i'd find out oh i want to study this movie or i found a new t- copy of a tape and yeah around 2015 2016 it became i've got to study all of canon and it's been a it's been a journey it's been going for five years now i was very fortunate to write a lot of it before taking it to publishers 
So, and I, I was writing it out of order. So a lot of the second volume before the, I even had a publisher for the first was written. So hence why volume two will be out next year because it's not, a, I don't have as much work to do on it, but yeah, it, it just took shape as this. It, as I learned more about these movies, I felt more and more compelled to pay them respect by writing about each and every one. And you don't just write about them. You've talked to so many of the people who are involved in them and the interviews are in the book. So as I said, Sam Furstenberg does the, the, the intro, the forward here. And then, I mean, you would be able to rattle them off more than I could, but you've talked to so many of the people involved with these movies. Mm -hmm. um, tell me some of the people, like, tell, tell our viewers some yeah, of the people sure. that you've talked well, Sam, to. Sam Furstenberg is, was one of the first guys I got to talk to, and he's one of the friendliest people I've ever, ever interviewed, whether it was for this book or for the magazine. And uh, he gave me some great stuff, and he wrote the foreword later, uh, later on. Um, James Bruner's another great guy um you've got diane franklin catherine mary stewart joe rubo steve lambert a stuntman who did, did a lot of the ninja movies and just fabulous stories um william Sachs, who came in and he's a professional movie fixer and he finished exterminator 2 for canon but he had done this to so many other movies and he's somebody that i just i could have listened to his stories and interviewed him for for days just yeah that stick with what was about canon but it's been really great i i have a lot of interviews done for the second one as well one of the ones that i'm really proud of for volume two is i talked to james karen the great actor who was most people know him from return of the living dead and he was in invaders from mars and he was 92 years old or Oh. Something like that. By the time we had a great two hour conversation and he passed away shortly after that. So it's, I'm really happy to have that interview just in time for the book, but I talked to him about his whole career and got his whole story. And so I feel like I got something there that is even more valuable than just the canon material. Yes. I can pay tribute to this guy's career because he was a great actor who worked for since the forties. It's amazing. Absolutely. Yeah. Hollywood history that you were able to tap into. Some of the, these guys have so much wisdom. They have so much experience. And um, I love to see people like you tapping into that because, again, if you're looking down your nose at some of this stuff, you're missing that. You're missing the importance of what these people bring to the table. Um, you also saw some of the people, some of the people involved with the, the break in movies. The, like, we got to start talking yeah. about some of the movies. This is Break In, Break In 2, Electric Boogaloo. There's. Mm -hmm. One in particular, listen, I want to talk to you. You're the only other person that I've talked to that has actually watched this movie. <laughs> I mean, people have watched it, but I haven't really had a chance to talk to anybody about it. And it's covered in the book. Uh, Dr. Heckle and Mr. Hype. What a weird freaking movie. So strange. Charles so B. Strange. Griffith. I mean, That's... it's... And it, but see, you, you bring a new appreciation to it for me because I didn't know the, about the whole casting stuff in this movie. Because it's got mm -hmm. Oliver Reed, who's the last person you would expect for this movie. Yeah. You can take it from me. I'll let you tell the story. But it's a crazy story. Yeah, it's one of the many, many adaptations of J uh, Jekyll and Hyde. And it, it's a very comedic take. It's about this very ugly foot doctor who basically becomes this handsome ladies man every time he takes this potion, but he accidentally kills people. It's a classic Jekyll and Hyde story, but yeah, they ended up getting Oliver Reed who, you know, at that point in his career was more known for his drinking and being just sloppy rather than being the handsome leading man that he was for the longest time, but they got him and somebody who was still famous as a leading man, but they put the grossest, funniest makeup on him throughout most of the movie. Yeah. Oh, oh, it's just, it's such a, it's such a canon move to get a, get a guy like that. And then in all the advertisements usually show the ugly, uh, ugly yeah. version of him rather than the, the suave debonair fellow on the other side of the poster. Yeah. But, oh, that's another movie. That's, that's one that was really a pain to find when I wrote about it. And then the Blu-ray came out and it was right. Like, yeah. It's ah. because of you. It's your research and your interest that 
prompted all this. No, <laughs> like, oh, this <laughs> I won't claim that, but there's some great people putting out some, some of these stranger canon movies right now, like the ones that have been yeah. obscure for a long time. And I got to be Is really it, wasn't Dick that. Van Dyke attached? Didn't they want Dick Van Dyke to be the... Yeah, yeah. That, that makes another, sense. Mm-hmm. Because it's another case of an actor that... A project that was written for one person and they couldn't get him, so they just shoved the next person in, even if he was very not correct for the part. Uh, yeah. Dick Van Dyke would have made a very different movie out of Dr. Huckle and Mr. Hype than Oliver Reed. But, but would we be talking about the movie if it was Dick Van Dyke? Mm, I mean, maybe. Maybe. <laughs> maybe. It probably would have been pretty good, but... Yeah. <laughs> but- it's the it wouldn't have been as interesting as it is now exactly part of the appeal of canon is that it's just a, sometimes they're just, it's a skew you know the, mm-hmm. the the powers that be made choices and you're like huh can you talk about <laughs> any favorite stories about the leadership at canon that you'd like to regale us with oh well that won't get you you know sent to the bottom of the ocean with cement shoes or anything like yeah, that yeah no. well i love any story about uh Menachem Kalan. he was I, I, in the course of writing these books and researching them, I became convinced. I don't think anybody loved movies, whether it was watching them or being involved in making them more than he did. And one of the stories that was recounted to me that I think is pretty much how his attitude was, was about over the Brooklyn bridge, which you brought up. And it was this movie that, you know, it's your romantic comedy starring Elliot Gold set in Brooklyn but the movie's called Over the Brooklyn Bridge. And the shot they have over the, over the top of the movie, this beautiful aerial shot of Elliot Gold's car going over the bridge, it's the Manhattan Bridge. He just didn't, didn't, didn't get the right one. And somebody pointed that to him in the editing phase, and his response was, eh, a bridge is a bridge. <laughs> but not when you name your movie after one of the most famous bridges, yeah. <laughs> most recognizable bridges. But he's, it's, it's stuff like that. There are lots of things like that when they... And Oliver Reed is a Dick Van Dyke. Eh, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's just the slur, things that are slightly off with canon movies yeah. because of a decision like that, that it really results in some magic, some of this, in some instances. Yeah, absolutely. So any uh, favorite discoveries or anything, you know, you've, you've seen there's what two, about 200 movies in the Canon catalog that you've researched probably right. more than that, but any discoveries that really blew your mind or stuff that I really, really love. I mean the Apple, that one's a cult movie. And it's pretty well known, but it's one that I hadn't seen until right around the time I was going to start on this project. Mm-hmm. And it's a sci-fi disco Mu- uh, bi- biblical musical Bible, yeah it's set in the far off year of 1994 this dystopian year 1994 made in 1980 and it's incredible it's an incredible movie and it's one that i was running ninja movies chuck norris movies as a kid i just never picked right. up and it's been one of my favorites because it's the one of the strangest weirdest movies actually i've got the nice i had the blu-ray but it's not here it's not in my stack i'm not sure where i put it but oh that's a that's a fantastic blu-ray the the kino larber one from a few years ago yeah but yeah that that was a major discovery Uh, some of these some of these movies that have cult followings but unless you're a specific cult following a cult follower of that movie tough guys don't dance is a movie that norman mailer made for canon and it has one famous clip of Ryan O'Neill saying, oh God, oh no, oh God, oh no. And it zooms and the camera spins for about 11 seconds. And people know that clip because it became a GIF. It became a, a Rick roll for a while. Yeah. But then you sit down and you watch the movie and everything about it is amazing. You've got an incredible por- performance from Wings, Wings Hauser, who's not dead. People were afraid for a few hours last week. Yes. He's dead, I think. Yes. And, I love uh, Wings Hauser. I feel like in the last, I don't know, just a few ye- last couple of years, this, the cult of Wings Hauser has really taken off. Have you seen that? Uh, yeah, yeah. I he's liked def- him, but it's like a, <laughs> it's up here now. Yeah, he's getting this sort of uh, Dennis Hopper like res- uh, yes. renaissance. Yeah, what? like I would love for him to make some just incredible movies right now and <laughs> towards the tail end of his career, and just people be awed by what yeah. he's done. 
Yeah, he's, you know, we got to reach, out, for a gotta reach out to Wings Hauser and be like, <laughs> "We're waiting for your Renaissance." Yes, yes, Phoenix, we're prized in the ashes. <laughs> yeah, but just some of these movies that I wasn't familiar with that that are well known. Um, there are ones that, if if something tended not to get a video release or a DVD release, if something hasn't been on home video in thirty years chances are it's not going to be as exciting as <laughs> yeah there's a reason why it's been buried but then there there are some of them that i i say i look at and like you know lorber like scorpion is suddenly doing they're finding these movies that are pretty darn good and putting them out and giving them sort of this revival they deserve yeah. case in point the the uh the naked face with roger yeah. moore kino lorber blu-ray uh, before them, I don't think anybody was talking about that movie. It was just no, kind of... no. That's one that went straight from VHS to the Blu-ray era where yeah. you couldn't you couldn't find it. And yeah, some other recent examples. Body and Soul, Scorpion just put out with a new Leon Isaac Kennedy interview on it. And yeah, that's a movie that just for the longest time was pretty obscure. Maybe a very out-of-print DVD release back in the day, but I watched that on tape for the book. <laughs> yeah. It was still VHS, you know, something I observe from my seat at Serial at Midnight is there's a lot of HD snobs that, okay, snobs is overstating. There's a lot of HD elitists mm -hmm. that say, I will only watch, now there's people that say, I will only watch 4K. But there's a lot of people that say, I will only watch Blu-ray. But look, v some of the, these movies are still trapped on VHS. And there's no alternative for that other than they're not on digital. You can't go into iTunes and just like, Oh, right. 499 for the, like, no, some of this stuff is still uh, back on those tapes. And so I don't know. There's value to this stuff. There's value to physical media. Yeah, I, I absolutely, I, I love physical media and I'm going to, I'm going to hang on to it as people keep declaring it dead year after year. And I mean, there's for a, place a dead for it. medium, it's costing us a lot of money, and it's more <laughs> prolific than it's ever been. You know, there. But there's, have we ever had it so good? That's the question. No, no we haven't. <laughs> um, yes. One of the things I wanted to talk to you about, I wanted to just ask you. I'm trying to find the movies, the Lou Ferrigno movies. I can't, I can't find it. The Lou Ferrigno Hercules. movies, sword and sandal movies, sword and sorcery. Mm -hmm. Um. I love that kind of stuff. I feel like maybe not enough people have loved it, but they're starting to kind of discover it. Can you tell me a little bit about your experience with those movies? Yeah, well, especially the the two Hercules movies that Canon put out are, when you mentioned my favorite stories, that's one of my favorite stories in this book, um, how they tricked Lou Frigno into making them. But yeah, so they wanted to make basically in the early 80s, Canon opened up an Italian studio. And this gave them access to a lot of Italian exploitation directors, a lot of guys who made very good and very bad zombie movies and cannibal movies in the late yeah. 70s, early 80s. And a lot of those actors, a lot of these actors who would do the Peplum films, they would do cannibal films. And Canon really went to produ into production there. Their Hollywood dollar could buy a little bit more in Lira and they had the industry that they could tap into. Italian, any of the spaghetti films, usually were at least on the same par of quality with a lot of the Hollywood movies that Canon was making. So it wasn't a big change in production value. But yeah, they got Lou Ferrigno right after the Hulk wrapped. And they really approached him. They got Hercules was one of his dream projects. He wanted to play Hercules ever since he was a young kid and just saw the old Steve Reeves. And one of the things that led him into bodybuilding got and made him get so jacked. And yeah, so they, he was ready to do it and went to, went to Italy. They made, made this first film. They made two films back to back. I should say that seven magnificent gladiators and Hercules seven magnificent gladiators which only got a video release, skip theaters, they declared unre unreleasable. Canon hated it when they saw it. So they fired the director, brought on Luigi Cozzi, who did Star Crash, and um, some great... Big Star great... Wars rip-off exploitation movie. Yeah. There we go, the good old German poster. 
see. And yeah, so they brought him in and he brought an idea to shoot Hercules that was more like Superman. He wanted to do Hercules as a superhero rather than your your general straight myth. And so looking at it like that, it's it's a lot like the superhero movies, but it also had a lot of great stop motion animation. Even though they didn't have the budget to bring in a Harryhausen, they brought in a great Italian crew and they brought these giant monster robots into the film and they look pretty good in the first one. They look, they move choppy, but that's how they're robots. It makes sense. Yeah. And when Lou Ferrigno went to, he, he didn't, he wasn't signed on for a second Hercules movie, but before he went home, Cannon went to the director and said, Hey, can you, can you shoot some new scenes for seven magnificent gladiators so we can put those in here and fix it, make it releasable. Can you fix this movie for us? And he said, sure. So he went and shot two weeks of footage with Ferrigno and Cannon saw it, they loved it. And they came with an idea and they said, if you can do this in two weeks, what if we get you another two weeks? You can shoot, they shot 30 minutes. You can shoot another 30 minutes worth of scenes and then you can have two weeks without without we'll send the American stars home and you can just have the Italian cast and you can shoot a full movie and we'll make this, it won't be seven magnificent gladiators at that point. It's going to be Hercules two. There's one condition. You can't tell Lou. Can't tell Lou that he's making a sequel because we haven't paid him for that. We're just paying him for reshoots. So he came back. They had a total of four weeks with Ferrigno and then two weeks with, they brought back all the characters from the first movie that Lou couldn't see on set because he'd know some, something was up. And he shot with them and they made Hercules too. And when it was done and they were going to announce it to bring it out in theaters, they just, they broke it to Lou Ferrigno. They broke the news. Hey, you're in the sequel. We're doing this. And they, they ended up working out a contract that I think was enough so they wouldn't get sued. But <laughs> yeah, I feel like you would not want Lou Ferrigno as an enemy, you know? Oh, no, no. Have you, you seen him when he's angry? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> yeah. No, it's, it's, it's just a crazy story. And I talked to, I talked to the director about it. And he was very matter of fact about it. And he had fun making those movies, even though people now, I, some, some, for a long time, people would look at him and they'd be cynical about it and be like, oh, look at these cheesy effects or, isn't it ridiculous that he throws a Hercules throws a bear into space and it is silly and it's ridiculous, but it's fun. It's fun. Like no other movies have, you know, Lou Ferrigno throwing a bear into space and isn't the world a better place that those movies exist. And that's absolutely. Yes. I love that stuff. I love these kinds. I'm still waiting for like a sword and sorcery renaissance or something for the, for the fan community to really discover these movies and latch onto them. I like Peplum movies. I gotta be honest Mm -hmm. with you. I love these early sixties Italian movies and just, it's like, it's a hard sell for some people. You're like, Oh yeah. Sergio Leone made this movie before the spaghetti Western movie. Not the same thing, but it's still pretty good. And they're like, um, yeah, maybe. So p- people are slowly, slowly discovering some of this stuff, especially in the, the Blu-ray era when we're getting so many. Do you know if those movies are there? I know there's a, a British Blu-ray. There's like a UK Blu-ray with the Sinbad. It's like uh, the two uh, Hercules and the Sinbad. Movie. I think 101 films, maybe. Yeah. Um, Scream, the Scream, Scream may have gotten something. Yeah, Scream has the first, they have both Hercules movies. Okay. And Kino put out Sinbad maybe three years ago. Three four years ago, yeah, but this is a, I, when I have a question. I'm just gonna hey, hey Austin, do you know if this is on Blu-ray? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Shoot me a message. Yeah, the so they, they did those ones. The I don't believe Seven Magnificent Gladiators is out on, and it's a shame because I, I I feel like that one isn't as bad as Canon thought it was at least. Yeah, because they ended up releasing what they had originally deemed unreleasable. Like that's the version of the movie we got because they used all the reshooting footage for Hercules two. And yeah, it, 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 it would be, it'd be worth a Blu-ray release. I would love to see someone dig that up and put it out. There's a lot of boutique labels and they need uh-huh. stuff to put out. So if any of them are watching this video. Yeah. And if, any, if any of them are watching and need bonus materials, whether it's uh, lobby cards, posters, I can, I can. The ones to do a commentary. Res- yeah. I'm I'm available. Just <laughs> shoot me a message. I would love to help out. I can't think of anybody more qualified. Um, Thank you. I think, unfortunately, like I could talk to you for for 
17 hours, but I feel like this is probably a good place to wrap it up for now, for mm -hmm. now. But the book is amazing. I want to make sure everybody knows what it is, where it is, how they can get their hands on it. Uh, it is The Canon Film Guide, volume one of three, 1980 to 1984. <laughs> I am going to put links, purchase links to this book. There's a hardcover version, right? It's in hardcover mm -hmm. and softcover. Um, is it digital as well? It is not yet. Not yet. Not it will yet. be okay. soon in sometime in the next few months. Well, I'll put the link to it in the description of this video. So you just scroll under us and you can find everything you need to know. Uh, plug away where this, this is your opportunity to, to just Great. sell everything. Yeah. Twitter uh, and Facebook, Canon Film Guide. Facebook especially because I sort of use that as a place to dump all of my extra materials. There's so much stuff. You're active. Stuff that, You're very active on that. Every day I try just to share something and things that I learn about the first book, movies I write about there that I learn about while researching two and three, I can continue to share it. So th that's my bonus materials up on, up on Facebook. And if you're a Canon fan, that's a great place to just keep following, keep the conversation going because I want to try to keep an active community there talking yeah. about these movies and yeah. sharing what I learned. Cause I, I love them. And there are lots of people who will love them as well. And, and yeah, that's, those are the two places. My contact info is also up on, it's up on the Facebook page and on the website. I've got a very, very basic website, but it's got all my, where to find me everywhere. Can I I'll, that I'll put that in the description of this video as well for you guys. So you can just find everything right there. You don't have to hunt for it, but yeah, we gotta, we gotta support this because the cult of Canon is alive and well. <laughs> Anything else that I, did I, did you, uh, did you say everything you needed to say? No, we've touched on everything. I am very excited. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. We need t-shirts. We need Canon Film Guide t-shirts. <laughs> and we need the hat and the lunchbox. We need oh. the Canon Films Guide lunchbox. I, I've got one thing. It's the, so in lieu of, I mean, this, this has been a weird year. There have not been any signings, any what? events, things, things that I was hoping for. You know, take the Canon Film Guide on the road. Someday in the future, I hope. But because we haven't had signings, I've... I have book plates and I'll be posting online where to, how to get them. I'll, I'll mail them to you. They're free. If you have the book, if you prove me you have the book, <laughs> I'll send you a copy of the signed book plate. But oh, nice. I don't know how this is showing up on camera, but it's made to look like one of those prismatic stickers yeah. you would have gotten in a vending machine back in, Fantastic. Pizza Hut in the late eighties, early nineties. Yes. That's awesome. Yeah. I'll be posting on my, all my channels. If, you know, I'm, I'm happy to send you a signed plate for your book. So. Very cool. Yeah. Very cool. So guys, support, support the love of Canon. Support that cult of Canon by picking up the Canon Film Guide. It is remarkable. It is, if this was it, it would be an achievement in and of itself. But to know that it is just the first third of what you've got planned is, uh, it's very exciting. For, for a Canon Films fan, for a movie fan, we have never, you know, there's been documentaries, there's been, specials and things like that but no one has ever devoted so much attention so much scholarship to the work of this one studio and i am so thankful for you for doing it so thank you for writing the book thank you for taking the time to talk with us about the book and for just being so generous thank you so much i appreciate thank you. you thank you and guys thank you for watching this video do take care remember scroll down click those links and until next time we will catch you later